Hello and welcome to the Aquarius Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Reed. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Aquarium Co-op. Aquarium Co-op is your one-stop shop for premium aquarium products to keep all your wet pets happy. Pick up top quality foods like extreme krill flakes, Hakari Vibra Bites, or Aquarium Co-op small fish and fry food. And as always, Aquarium Co-op stocks a wide range of healthy and vibrant plants to add a splash of color and natural filtration to any aquarium. So head on over to www.aquariumcoop.com and check out all the goodies for yourself. Now, on to the interview. So Dean, let's move on to the, uh, to the interview section. Oh, no. Of this we're podcast. We're doing an interview, too? Yeah, and I, we are down to nine hours and 40 minutes of audio storage on this. Plenty so of time. So you've got a water. I have a water. We should be good yep. for and the duration of this. I can push a button. We ordered pizza. Oh, oh wonderful. Awesome. <laughs> wonderful. Uh, there, fun fact, Dean. Do you know what episode number this is? Um, 600, I hope. 100. Dang. Not well, quite 600. Well, because you know why I asked 600. Why? Because... Today was my 600th post on Instagram. I saw that. I liked it. I yeah. got the little heart for you. Nice. Yeah. So I was thinking, oh, man, if he matched me. And the thing I didn't realize oh, no way. is it was two years and exactly eight months to the day today when I started Instagram. Are you one of those daily posters? You post I, a lot. I, don't I, know. I have. I don't post every single day. I have done that in the past, but I try to do four to five a week. Oh, you're crushing me. 107. Yeah. And my last one is Jimmy in his Michelin no, I remember Man that. outfit. Yeah. See, see, that picture wouldn't be there if you weren't, if that office wasn't locked when you, late uh, night. Goodness. Ah, that was at like 1 p.m. No, no, no. I'm saying that picture oh, wouldn't be oh, there. Oh, oh, my. Uh, if, if one of those times when I was there late at night, the office wasn't locked. So what Dean is talking about is my custom, my custom Peru piece of art right. that uh, the, the, the artist in Iquitos that had his uh, painting stand or his painting booth, um, I had him, I commissioned uh, while I was down in Peru, uh, him to do a discus, a wild Peruvian discus in his style, which head over to the Aquarius podcast. Yeah, you'll see you can, it. Right. You, you can see it. Uh, Dean liked the idea so much, he had the guy do it in black, though. Because, no, he did two without me knowing. He did one on a white background. That's right. And then he did one on the ba- black background. That's and right. You, and you got the black background. Right. Which they both look amazing. Right. And um, his angelfish ones look cool, too. The, and actually, that's the original. I think he had the angelfish and then maybe one more other fish that yes. he had in that style. Right. So he didn't do the discus. Not yet. And actually, I had to show him what... A fi- a, what a I had to show him it. the picture of it, yeah. And so I sent it to his WhatsApp or whatever messenger system we were using. Um, and then we went on our boat trip. And five days later, six days later, came back and he was done. And actually, halfway through, I think he finished it in like three days and he sent me a picture of yeah. it. And it was, it was cool. I was so excited. Yeah, it's cool. And picture. it was with the exchange rate, it was well worth the, I'd say the so. price. Yeah. 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 Very inexpensive. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's not often that you find something in your travels that's okay, we have to have that, mm-hmm. you know? And, um, it, and other than the length, it just, you know, they took it off the, the frame. And it rolled just rolled up. up. It just rolled up and fit in the tube. Yep. Yep. Like perfect thing for a uh, for a souvenir. So right. good times. Yeah. So Instagram posts, uh, good job. Well done. 600. I'm yeah. at like 100. So you're clearly crushing it on that. But yeah. yeah, it took me, how long have I been doing this podcast now? Three years? Something like that. Definitely longer than I've been at the co-op. And I've been at the co-op for maybe two and a half-ish years. Yeah. Um, so maybe it took me three years to get to 100 episodes. Uh, not quite one a week. If whoever yeah, wants to do the math, still, yeah. <laughs> but but the the odd thing about mine was it, it, I just noticed it this morning. It, okay, it's the same day of the month. Two years, eight months later. Is that what made you check? Just the anniversary, like kind of thinking that. No, because what I was looking at, I was look, I I looked at my Instagram. What day I posted the first post, mm. and I'm like, oh man, it's the same day. And we were in, I mean, obviously it was a different month, but it's the same day. So you know how I started Instagram? No. Oh. Corey and I were sitting after dinner in Peru in, in, I call it the fish lodge where we were staying. And, and we had limited Wi-Fi there. And this is go wild trip? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm communicating with my daughter and wife at home and he's communicating and he, and uh, there's a couple other guys there and, and uh, someone asked the Instagram question and Corey said, well, Dean, you have one. I said, no. He said, so we started one <laughs> while I was in Peru 
Um, and that and that's where it's been ever since. You know, nice. it started. So, do you feel does it take away from the experience being able to access internet while collecting fish? Because being on the boat, it felt, we had no access. It felt a little wrong having internet access on the boat. So, but you didn't always have it on the boat. You, you we ha- almost always had it on the boat. There was maybe like one like hour long trip during a, a you know the boat took a certain bend, yeah, and maybe it was gone. But it seemed like more often than not we had internet access. So, I don't even remember ever accessing it when I was mm-hmm. on the boat ever. Um, now, the previous boat trip I took with my wife and daughter, um, we went the opposite way. Mm-hmm. So on our trip we went upstream. Or did we go downstream? I have no we, idea. Well, we went one way, but either way, the trip before I took there, we went the opposite way, and we would only get internet access as we passed some of the larger villages. Mm-hmm. And my daughter would just light up, especially if it was at <laughs> night. Because, okay, I can do all my messages all at once. Um, I downloaded pictures from my camera to my... I think I took my small laptop on that trip. Or maybe I took my iPad. I can't remember. So that's what I would do at night. Download pictures and try to edit them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I never did access the internet while we were on the boat. Now, mm-hmm. as soon as we got back to the hotel, then I tried to catch up. You know, so. But yeah, I think it is a little weird. I, I you know, it's almost, if you're out in nature, be out in nature. Yeah. I mean, you know? it, it was great being able to get the communication that everything was okay at home. Yes. With, you know, two young yeah. boys. Um but it just felt like I was I was actually kind of looking forward to the having having that you know technology disconnect, mm-hmm. and we kind of didn't have it. And the other disappointment that I had was I thought that I was going to have like star viewing every single night, and I'm pretty sure it was overcast every single night. It was overcast. Yeah. I mean, we had a few nights. That I was, saw like uh, there were there were like no stars. Yeah, I was I was like I'm going to be in the Amazon. This is going to be like the most amazing star viewing I've yeah. ever had in my life. Uh, and no, actually, yeah, you might have been wasn't. right because, it was a bummer. because when I was down there before, we had it every night. You could go up on that upper deck, yeah. and the sky would just be yeah. black with stars in it. There, there is something that I think the human condition needs to be able to see the stars as they actually are from yeah. from Earth. And I think that so many of us that live, whether you're in the urban center or you're just in a general suburb, like you are just surrounded by light pollution. Yep. And Ooh. what we see is just it's not a sad, sad. Yeah. sad Sad, sad, you know, version of what actually is up there. Yeah. Um, and I think the, geez, it's probably been since the last time I went to the Azores, which was for my wedding, about 10 years ago. It was the last time that I really, really, really saw the stars. Wow. Amazingly well, where you can see the the Milky Way. Yeah. And it's like, well, sure. And, and I, grant, I've got kids, but yeah, just go out, you know, three hours outside of your major centers. And at nighttime, then you could probably get a pretty good shot of stars. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it... it being able to go into like the back patio area of where you're staying and just look up right and just see yeah. just amazing like the heavenly body of stars that are up above your head and literally everything else is just black at night yeah i mean i mean you might see some eyeballs in the in the along the shore of you mm-hmm. know river rats or whatever yeah but um, yeah, it's literally yeah. it's dark. But it's like how much creativity, like how much human creativity is spawned because people look up and see the stars. And now that we're not doing that, I think a lot of inventions started there. I'm sure. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So. <laughs> but we have seriously yeah. digressed for yeah, this episode of the Aquarius Podcast, Dean. What is happening in your fish life? What's going on? What's new and so, exciting? So I don't know that there's anything new and ex- well, there are some new things, and there is there some exciting exciting things i don't know well so we were talking uh, randy was just down in the fish room and and i'm like i have not really actively set fish up for breeding spawning since last june reason why what what, which is a lot because prior to june uh you know we we went into lockdown what in march basically last march um I bred so much that I overbred Mm -hmm. and I had literally no more tank space for fry. And uh, just now I'm starting to finally empty out fry tanks to where, okay, I'm comfortable 
breeding some more fish and raising up fry. Because there's nothing worse than breeding a bunch of fish and not having room to raise them and have them die on you. Um, that's just a horrible feeling. It's, it's better just to not do it. So, um, and you know, and co-op's been open the whole time. That's where almost all of my fish go. Mm-hmm. Um, they've taken hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fish over the last few months, but I haven't needed to breed more because, and now we're going into summer where that's usually a slower time, but, but summer is actually the best time to start breeding because then those fry will be large enough to sell Mm. in the fall and winter time. Yeah. 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 Right. So it's really good to start breeding in the summertime. And then by the time fall and winter hits, you have lots of fish to sell. Have you been itching to work with anything new or have you been itching to to actually do breeding? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I, I've, I've got the uh, wild discus starting to breed. I'm expecting this fall. I might possibly be into my second generation, not getting huge numbers. I didn't really expect to, but, um, relative to your domestic, how are, how, like, what is the yield relative to say, like, uh, um, you know, a designer discus that you've worked with before in the past? So, yeah. So in the past, I would typically get, uh, anywhere between three and 400 fry per, per spawn. And right now I believe the largest spawn of wilds that I've had is maybe, maybe 150 fry. Oh, wow. That's the ones that we saw that were small right now. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, the largest prior to that is maybe 25 that I've kept alive. So it's a lot, and it also depends on the pair. Is it is it for lack of initial clutch size of eggs? No, I think okay. it's lack of, um, are they fertilizing them properly? Mm. Um, because the, the eggs are fertile, in my opinion, from the female, mm-hmm. but they're not being completely fertilized by the male. And some, some of the times it's like, oh, I'm photographing that for Instagram and maybe I interrupted the process. Mm. Uh, that does happen. Um, um, I will, I mean, just the other day I was photographing um, the Philippine blue angels in the middle of a spawn and not one egg hatched. So, you know, that can happen. You can, yeah, you sure. can interrupt the process. Um, it's a, it's amazing that the fish could even feel comfortable enough in a glass box to actually reproduce, especially after living in the wild. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's different than a fish. Okay. Is a fish that's raised in a tank. That's all they know. Um, you know, fish are instinctive. I I don't know that they, um, have a brain per se. I've Mm -hmm. never actually studied that. I'm pretty sure they don't but they do have instincts. And um, I think, you know, you're taking a fish from the wild, you put it in a glass box with a human in front of the box and the human's the only one that drops food in. Mm -hmm. So are they trainable? Maybe. I mean, some, some fish obviously are. I I would think what probably helps to make up for the, the, the initially alien surrounding of being in an aquarium versus the wild is the eventual learning that there's no predation. True. Right. Which that is true. There's a, there's an Instagram that I follow that's like massively popular. It's called Nature is Metal, mm-hmm. and it is just like you know if you ever wanted to remind yourself of how actually brutal the animal kingdom is in nature in general, follow that Instagram page. Yeah, it is brutal. It is like it's... brutal to the point where it's like horses eating baby chicks and like right. And that's like the more domestic, you know, right. wa- You know, more tame one, but. You know these these videos that of like African savannas, safaris, and yeah. just like <sighs> animals eat animals. Fish, <laughs> it is fish eat fish. Hardcore. So so kind of having that context of it is insane in the wild. Right. It is Thunderdome on steroids every day. Every every waking moment of right. your existence is right. don't get eaten. Right and and every sleeping moment when the yeah. when the when the uh, nocturnal fish come out. Yeah yeah. So so if you remove that and the fish have an intelligence enough to be like, oh, I'm actually, I'm okay. I'm not threatened. And now this major, so it's 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 um, predation, it's eating, and it's breeding, right? Like those are right. the three main things main that, things. that yep. an animal's going to do. You've now eliminated the predation. Right. All right? And so now right. all I have to focus on is just eating, which 
they're they're getting it every single day, right? right. Several times a day from this big bipedal weird thing that comes to the glass yeah. and you know drops, drops in food, food. In. <laughs> yeah. And so then it's just mating, right? right. So I, I guess naturally then you know, it, as long as they have that understanding that there's no predation and they're not constantly in fear of that, right. um, which I think some fish are still more skittish than others inherently. Probably. Um, I guess maybe that would explain why they feel comfortable enough to breed then. Right. And, and you know, you, you take that another step. Okay, so there are fish in the wild that live from dry season to dry season, and that's their life, you know, one year. Um and and there is yeah they're like okay when's this thing gonna dry up on me so like I'm a killifish like all right I'm just waiting to get turned into a, a piece of fish jerky yeah. and it never comes and it never comes or or and or I have to spawn because this is when my babies hatch I mean there there's thoughts out there that some apistos are annuals hmm. because their babies do grow very fast and they spawn very fast mm-hmm. when they're young. Um, remember those tiny puddles we were getting right? yes those tiny tiny puddles. The, those you, are those are shovel, chalked. You those shovel chalked through the fish. leaves, and you yeah. got tons of little fish. I was surprised at how prevalent apistos were down there. Yeah, it was yeah. every scoop. Um, you could you could almost pull up apistos if you were in the right spot. Right, right. Um, and and sometimes also smaller tetras, mm-hmm. pencil fish. You know, um, got a lot of them. You know, so and and the guy on on our particular trip that was the killifish guy. He got tons and tons of killifish from those. Shout out, shout out to Tony. Tony, that's <laughs> it. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's. Uh, so we're talking about discus difference between the yields of your um, design, previous designer discus and wilds clutch size between the two. No difference. Potential for fertility, fertility of the eggs, not necessarily different, but now we're thinking maybe the male, the male, the wild yeah. male, which again, maybe back to this wild discussion, I, it would be interesting to know like actual fertility, like rates or hatch rates of a clutch of eggs that right. doesn't get preyed on. And you, you wonder, I mean, I, I'm, I would tend to bet that in nature there, there's still laying, say, say they're laying just for sake of example, 400 eggs. Mm-hmm. I would bet in nature, maybe 20 of those reach adult. Mm, yeah, for sure. Right? Now, they might at first start with a clutch and they might manage to get 200 to hatch and not get eaten by fish that come by in the night or whatever mm-hmm. or that they can't hide from them. Um, so, but but if you remember when we caught a lot of fish, a lot of torn up fins, that's not from the environment that, well, it's from getting chomped on, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, it's not like they had a whole lot of fin rot. It was just teeth marks out of their fins. It's rough, so it's rough out there. It is. It's very rough out there. So, <laughs> so um, you know, so now we're taking those fish and we're, we're putting them in the, not necessarily a sterile environment, but it is more sterile than the wild mm-hmm. or not. The wild is getting 10 times more water changes. No, that's that's incorrect answer. Probably like millions, thousands of millions times, of times more thousands water Thousands of times more water changes. Constantly flowing water. It's constantly flowing. It might look turbulent, but that doesn't really affect the quality. quality. That affects the, the visibility. Mm-hmm. So now we're taking those and we're saying, okay, there's nothing to prey on the fry. Let's Let's raise them up. And maybe, maybe we're doing it too sterile. I, I've heard, I've heard that brought up of, of potentially your fish room that you run such a sterile operation that if you, if some of you, and, and I, I don't think there's much to this, right? Yeah. But it's just a theory that if fish come from such a sterile environment and they go somewhere that's maybe not the most sterile, like say my fish room is not the most sterile. And they're like, what is this? Like I came from like this, you know, white glove, ultra clean right. aquarium to a place where, and that's a, that's a, a testament to your dedication to your fish room. I'm not saying that in a negative way at all, but to somebody who doesn't do nearly as many water changes or gravel vax as much as you do, and maybe has that layer of mulm, you know, maybe they don't, maybe there's something to that, right? Yep. Yep. I mean, and, and see, I don't consider my fish room anywhere close to sterile. Mm-hmm. Maybe the, the closest part would be the fry system because you don't run UV sterilizers anywhere, right? No, well, actually, I have one, mm-hmm. and that's on the fry system. Okay, I, I just recently added that. 
Um, and I don't know why it's, well, I know why it's because of COVID. Oh, we can't say COVID. <laughs> don't say COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's, you know, because I had nothing else to do. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. <laughs> you know, I want to run one because um, my hard airline tubing, clear hard airline tubing in my fry system is constantly getting clogged with algae. Um, like green algal growth. Green algae. Yeah. yeah. And so, so that's where uh, UV sterilizer would so help you. So every couple of weeks, what I do is I take it off the little... Pipe the, cleaner? The, the, no, I blow on oh, the other end. Okay. <laughs> I just blow the gunk out and then I put yeah. it back. So what I've since done is just taken black airline tubing mm-hmm. and um, I just run one of the ZIS um, air valves because the they're super heavy and yep. it just sinks it. Yeah. Because the hard airline tubing, obviously, like it's rigid. It, do, it, it right. goes exactly where you want it to. Right. But, um, you know, unless I want to run a UV sterilizer, which I'm not opposed to it, um, no, I mean, I mean, I'm I'm trying it because I had nothing else to try at the time, mm-hmm. and and I am still getting a few fry here and there. I mean, obviously the discus, there's some d- there's some different plecos going on in the fish room right now that I'm getting fry from. Just got a spawn of the uh, orange laser quarries nice. that have just hatched today, and uh, so there's few there's a few that I'm playing with, but but you know, like taking the rams. I mean, I still have enough rams in my fish room to supply the stores for another six months, probably, you know, so I finally, I think maybe three weeks ago, Robert finally took the last of my angels that I yeah. had been holding on to for like a year. It's yeah. And it's those were so good crazy. size. They were huge. Yeah. They were huge. Yeah. <laughs> They're basically yeah. like a breeding age and I'm just like, take them all. I told take him them. to put them on sale. I said, Robert, <sighs> yeah, I said, it's, Put them on sale; they will sell. You know? I mean, they're great looking fish. There's yeah. some uh, there's some pearl scales that are mixed in there. Right. You know, the my angels throw like four different varieties, and each of the four look really, really, really good. nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, I've got uh, I've got another like forty that are or more like twenty five that are about you know quarter size. Quarter size. Yeah. Yeah. That I should probably. Are you keeping any for future breeders? I do. I actually have two two pairs. Okay. Yeah, I've got two good. pairs that are actually the breeders. Yeah. So I had a I had a spawn that I tried, uh, and we've we've kind of talked about this offline before. I, I've wanted to um, get a little bit more black into the red koi mm. angels rather than uh, the white that shows up. So I took my one of my best red koi females and crossed it with a double black, and I ended up with a lot of white looking fish did you uh, you didn't already have the double black right i got a double black okay so what i don't want to i don't want to stop you mid-thought but what was your process to get the? i guess i am (laughs) to get get the double black like who you don't have to say names like where did it come from? i found it in the shop okay yeah in the the shop shop. you did your quarantine thing it was probably already an adult age it was um quarter size oh okay. so i grew them i grew them for a while i actually bought two i lost one along the way Mm. um Grew them for a while and then, you know, selected the right female. I determined it was a male. And I don't know how I did that, actually. <laughs> Maybe 50, I just guessed. 50 50. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's, you know. that seems, that's how I get lucky. I, I, you know, and that's the other thing is I tend to never really get too into sexing fish. They will do that for you if you let them. Yeah. You just have to have a group at first. So. So, you know, people always ask me, how do you sex this? I go, well, I put six of them together and two of them pair off. Yeah. You know, um, other than that, I, you know, you can read online, you can read books, and there's all sorts of information about look at this fin, look at that fin, look at nodes on the fin. Does it have the forehead hump or not? Yeah, body, all of that. like relative yeah. body size to the right. other mate or the other potential mate in the. By the time you spend all the time doing that, wouldn't it be easier just to put six of them together and mm-hmm. say, Oh, those two well, are a pair. Well, for sure, if it's a female and you let it be in an aquarium by itself for long enough, they will lay. Mm-hmm. They will lay, like, regardless of if there's a male or not. Correct. And then you can write, you can put that big female sign on the aquarium yeah. and know that I know for sure that's a female. I yeah. just got to get the male. Or what I do is once I once I know it's a female, I'll take a picture on my phone and I can label that picture. Mm-hmm. So then I can always look back and say, okay, that was the female. Yeah. So now I just got to find the male. So yeah, so I... I Put the two together, and uh, I know that I'm gonna have to go into several more crosses to bring the black out. But I I took Aquarium Co-op all of the or half of those fry just as mixed angels. I couldn't sell yeah. them as as blacks. I couldn't sell them as uh, red koi. 
they were just a mixed angel. How are, how are, how did that first uh, batch turn out? Are you starting to see like of the ones that were yeah. koi, you were starting to see some darker, some, some darker splotches. Nice. And um, I mean, there's some that turned out solid black, mm-hmm. which you would expect. There's some that turned out really white, almost like platinum-y. Really? Which I didn't expect. And there's some that turned out more like koi. Right. And so my next cross would obviously be taking the koi to the koi. Did you make your pun at square to try to like no, reverse, reverse those genetics? <laughs> I, know take you back to I know that's Eighth grade enough. biology, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should have done that probably. <laughs> and so now you're going to be working on, you haven't had a second spawn yet? No, they're okay. not old enough yet. Okay. They won't, they won't be old enough until... Okay. Oh, the crossing. The, yeah. The, the crossing. This generation. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so probably about another couple months. Yeah. Three, four months probably. Yeah. So yeah, I've been playing with that and, uh, you know, just working on keeping everything else going. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't look at it, but the lungfish is too big for his tank. Oh, nice. He's in a 60, right? He's in a 65 and he's over half as long as the tank. What are you going to do with and him? What is, the, what is the end plan for Lumpy, the lungfish? Well, you know, actually, to be honest, I actually called the Seattle Aquarium, called Point Defiance Zoo. These are all places around me. Uh-huh. Um, called the Woodland Park Zoo, uh, to, but none of them were interested. Mm. And most of them were actually closed to the public at the yeah. time I called. And so then I'm thinking, okay, so maybe I have to keep him. So uh, there's a guy that's going to be moving his fish room pretty soon, and I might score a 125 from the old place. There you go. Uh, but then i got to find a place for it. How long is that 125 going to last lumpy until he outgrows that? <sighs> Depends on if I put other fish in with him and what the filtration is. But I I think he will max out no longer than three feet. My guess would be shorter because of, you know, being brought in from the wild. Right. Um, what kind of girth do you expect on? About like your wrist. Okay. That's, uh, you know, uh, a good man size wrist probably. Um, uh, that's what I would expect. But uh, he does not seem to predate on any other fish. Uh, although I believe if you had a fish that was sick in there that was, you know, swimming erratically along the bottom that he could catch, he would he would eat it. Easy meal for him. Yeah, I think I think he's, um, you know, they're omnivore. What about the lumpy Murphy tank? Would he be a good, I, I, a good I buddy? I tried that. <laughs> oh, what did Corey say? No, he? Oh, he shot that down. That's awesome. <laughs> And I also tra- talked about, um, you know, another big tank in the shop. So the move is Corey. Cor- he's going to have so many. He, how many totes are at the new uh, the Urban Fish Farm? There's going to be fifty three, I believe. Fifty three totes, yeah. right? So hundred gallon ones. What you need to do is just find one of those totes that is in like the most obscure part, corner, yeah, uh, the obscure put corner. Put in there. Put enough like rock ground cover, right, yeah. and then just slip them in there one day. <laughs> Good. It but is. I don't even think that tote would be big enough long term. Yeah, um, I, I I want more. He, yeah, length. he needs long. Yeah, but but I've I've heard there is a two twenty some gallon g- going to be moved there eventually. The one in the front room. The one from the living room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, and uh, that doesn't have any fish pen for it yet. So you never know. But you know, in reality, that's not the right place for him. It, I would rather have him in a shop where people, cause he's very prehistoric looking. Mm-hmm. And, and in my opinion, I've, I've, I've only seen pictures and, and one live South American or African lungfish before there's an African one, South American one. And I believe Australian lungfish, there might be others. I don't know. But the South American one that, that we brought back in my opinion is the best looking one. So, <laughs> That's such a funny way to phrase that. I mean, you know, the best he, looking of he, the lungfish. He's just oh, so man. prehistoric looking. You know, it's like, it's like, okay, he's kind of cool, and and everybody that's seen him thinks, wow, he's pretty cool. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that'd be like looking at a Velociraptor in Jurassic Park. I think right. those look cool. Right. Exactly. Doesn't mean I'm going to have one in my house. No. Though. No. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that would be that would be a, a really awesome ending if it's like Point Defiance Zoo is like, yeah, we're actually doing a South American exhibit. Right. We'll take your lungfish. Right. 
But, you know, I would worry, uh, you know, that's one of the things I, I want someone that would have a permanent exhibit. Because mm-hmm. a lot of zoos, they have, a, yeah, we'll take them and then, okay, that exhibit's over. Let's get rid of all those fish. Do they really do that? Well, I'm, guessing, I'm guessing that they do. Well, I thought they usually keep them for a really long time. I would, th- I would hope so. Yeah. But, you know, now the Vancouver Aquarium up in Canada had a really awesome South American exhibit, but they've closed to the public now. Oh, yeah. So, so I didn't get to contact them, but that would have been another choice. What are you feeding Lumpy the Lungfish? What's his, what's his staple food? I feed him what those those wafer things that you guys sell. Uh, sinking wafers. Yeah, yeah, sinking. Or bottom uh, bottom wafers. I think they are called wa- now extreme bo- bottom wafers. Yeah, something like that. Uh, sorry, I sorry, Hakari. I won't call them sinking wafers. Well, because I I <laughs> dumped them out of the container into a plastic <laughs> container, so I don't know what they were officially called. Uh, he gets those. He'll get uh, cocktail shrimp. Mm, okay. The, the pre cooked ones. Um, I also buy frozen clams that are not on the half shell. So just the clams. The whole clam? Or just yeah, the clam but meat? But they're small. The clam meat. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So they're they're um he gets that. Uh bloodworms he loves. He anything. How long would it take for him to come out and actually because they're blind, right? Are they blind? I, I didn't know that. I thought I thought they were blind. No, I think they have eyes. I think they have eyes, but they don't work. Maybe I don't or know. Or like they sense on like a different. I can tap on the tank, and he knows there's food coming in. All right, let's 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 see if we can look this up. Are we going to look our lungfish blind? South American lungfish. I thought they were blind. Uh, great for a uh, audio podcast. What we're right. Here. Keep talking, team. Okay, so I don't think he's completely blind. How long does it take for him to come out once you feed him? Like immediately. Drop, immediately? Okay. Immediately. Um, I, I, if I tap on the tank, he knows food's coming in. <laughs> so, yeah. Are, are so. you being Darla from Finding Nemo, tapping kind, on the kind tank? Of, <laughs> kind of. And, and part of it is also to scare the tetras away, So, because uh, uh, the tetras are very aggressive in there. So, um, Which yeah. tetras are in there? The monk ones? The monk ones, okay. yeah. yeah. And those are the ones with the red over the eye? Red eye and a little red spot on the tail. Gotcha. Right. Right. So... So yeah, so he's still kind of the family mascot here, and probably will be for a while. <laughs> the Tweedale um, family mascot is the lungfish, and uh, and then the other thing I, I actually have been playing with. In fact, I, I showed you earlier that we I just picked up some new types of rice fish. Yes, talk about um, those. I t- I I've been breeding the orange ones, and uh, I turned eleven into over four hundred in three, four months over last summer. And I intended to try to do that again this summer because basically that three, four months let me supply the shop with those for a year. Mm-hmm. And if I if I repeat that in the same amount of space, then I will have the shop supply mm-hmm. for a year. And then um, I just picked up these platinum ones, which are more platinum than I've ever seen mm-hmm. myself. And um, because the platinums that Corey had uh, that he has, um, they're more of like a bluish, bluish like a light bluish platinum, and they're very pretty fish. They are gorgeous, yeah. These ones, though, are like a like pristine white, yeah, with a very, very distinct, you know, thick for the body, like running along the back, around the top uh, of the back, yeah, yeah. along the top of the back from basically like mouth all the way to the back, uh, the back tail, the caudal tail, caudal tail, caudal tail. Uh, tail Coddle fin. fin. Coddle fin. Tail, tail fin. Well, Whatever. Yeah, I'm mixing. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a biologist. Leave me alone. Um, <laughs> and I mean, it is a very vibrant stripe. I mean, yes. these fish are awesome. And uh, when I saw them at the store, yeah, uh, what was it, last week? Last week, yeah. I told Robert, I'm like, dude, these are amazing. He's like, right? I was talking about these sea guys. Right. Like, they are... You know they're they're under the same platinum heading, but yes. uh, they are really really awesome fish, and I think that'd be great to see you uh, work with those ones. And we already have fry in my in my yes tank. yes. So we actually, Robert, if you're listening to this, I already have fry. <laughs> yes, and, Robert, it is. Uh, and let's see. Oh, the, I've March had those seventeenth, St. Patrick, Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Yeah, by the way, and you doing corned beef and cabbage tonight? No, I think I am. Are you? Yeah, I'm coming over then. Yeah, you can come yeah. over and have dinner with us. Yeah. So Rowan loved you, man. Uh, yeah, I bet he, he was. Would. Hold, you he know, did. he was holding. He was all over me. He was that. holding your hand the Don't whole time. Go away. Come on, Mr. Dean, come with me. <laughs> Let's Mr. Go Dean, see this. 
Uh, yeah, so I think I've had those for a week, and I've got fry that are swimming already. You've got, yeah. So talk about that setup that you've got set up for them. So actually, the, the setup that they're actually in is a 20 long. Um, why they're in is because I'm basically quarantining them for a pond, which you brought those ponds, right? Perfect. <laughs> the whole the whole point of the, of this adventure is to bring Dean two hundred and fifty gallon Rubbermaid to, uh, right. tote pond things, and yeah, they are in your unless your neighbor stole them. It may, yeah, I so. I I made my delivery. So so the the twenty gallon tank that they're in is something that I built so I could photograph it for. I've been doing online talks about the fry system mm. for clubs. So that's why it has the fry system built on top of it mm-hmm. like it is. Uh, so I was literally just using it on that counter f- to photograph as I built it. And then, I, of course, I had to fill it with water. I had to put, you know, Water's optional. the fry system in it. And so then um, when I got those fish, I'm like, okay, they can go in there for quarantine. And I think there's a few plant plant pots that need, um, what do they need? Those 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 aquarium co-op easy plants. Do you do you need some? I had some at my house actually sitting I next to these palms. I should things. have brought you some. Yeah. Because I know I, I know I Corey's mean, gonna need a ton. Yeah. Um yeah. Um yeah the, the aquarium co-op easy planner. Yeah. Uh, I've got like six extra that I probably yeah, should have brought you. They um that's what those plants are designed for mm-hmm. basically. Um and uh you know I've only had two plants that I found died in those but then I realized the plants didn't really die. I put in baby plecos. <laughs> and like it or not, baby plecos, even though they will chew on wood and eat baby brine shrimp and anything else you throw in the tank, they will chew on any plant matter that they can get their mouths on. Notorious on swords. Yes. Uh, notorious on swords. And I've noticed yes. that with uh, pennywort. I feel like that they, they do like the pennywort. Yep. Yep. So anyway, but Anubius, they're your friend with Anubius. Though. Pretty much, they because they will they will clean, clean the Jesus out of your Anubius, yep. your Boos, um, yep. any of those harder, uh, harder, harder leaf plants. Ones, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so I uh, I kind of so that's my fault, right? <laughs> Maybe that is my fault. Yeah. With you, it's probably the fish's fault. So anyway, going back to the setup, so it's a twenty long. Mm-hmm. It was set up as a fry system, so it has a, a external um, aqua clear hang on back filter that just has sponges in it. Um, I think it also has a co-op sponge filter in there on the other end. And you're purposely running it lengthwise, right? So it runs the the flow is the length of the tank, or is that just... I ran it that way because that's how the fry system works, because there's mm. normally trays front to back. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? So, so that's, why it's, that's why it's on there lengthwise. It doesn't have to be on there lengthwise. Uh, in fact, I could clip four zip ties and just take the whole fry system off, and it would just be a 20-gallon long with a filter on the end. Nice. So... Um, so what I've done is uh, I put a spawning mop in there, mm-hmm. and then I have a floating tray thing. It's the Swiss tropical, whatever that's called, German breeder ring thing where you can put like air driven filtration that runs underneath that right. real mic- real fine micron right. uh, mesh. But you're not using you're not utilizing that. You're just using it as a floating round dish, right? With a uh, with mesh wa- bottom. Yeah. yeah. And I do have yeah. water from the fry system pouring in it. Mm. And that's probably why we saw the baby brine shrimp in there. Yeah. And you got a little bit of java moss too in there. And there's java moss yeah. in there. So so I literally, uh, what I did in the pond last year is I, I netted f- living fry out uh, and put them in a, nesh, a mesh breeder like that. Um, in the case, in the quarantine tank, I'm taking the eggs out because the, the, the rice fish will eat eggs and fry. And I have no floating plants in there right now. So there's no cover for fry. Mm-hmm. So I'll take the fry out in this case, or the eggs out, I'm sorry, and, and hatch them. And we've, what did we count? About seven that have hatched already? There was a, there, yeah, you had a good number of, uh, of little fry in there. And, and then, then I think we pulled, or you pulled with my, with my out. assistance holding a flashlight. That's right. Which was critical. That is critical. Right? <laughs> um, I think you got at least. 15 eggs? 15 to fifteen to 20, somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, and then you're just taking the eggs and putting them straight into that little floating dish. Right, and same water. Yeah, yeah, same water, good to go. Yeah. That's awesome. And it works really well. You, uh, then you can, you know, you'll get the fry up to where they can fend for themselves. They can go back in with the parents, mm-hmm. you know, so. What's uh, what's the feeding regimen for that uh, for that setup? It's only 
leftover live, live baby brine shrimp. Okay. Live baby brine shrimp. Live from where? Baby brine where, shrimp. where are you getting your uh, baby brine shrimp from, Dean? Well, I hatch it myself uh, in my Zis breeder. <laughs> and then where did it? Where oh, no, the... it's not a breeder. It's a Zis hatcher. It's the, well, technically, it's the Artemia, bl- Artemia blender. That's too hard the, to say. Is the marketing on that product. Um, but uh, yeah, so you're using that, but then you're also using the gold standard eggs. Eggs. Yeah, the, from that the, the produced liquid gold from Aquarium Co-op. Close your ears yeah. if you're getting sick of the uh, product plugging. <laughs> Aquarium Co-op, liquid baby brand shrimp. Or no, yeah. no, it's not liquid baby brand it's shrimp. Liquid it's liquid gold. It's, 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 it's the liquid gold. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, so we, we, I mean, we could talk about those brine shrimp eggs a little bit because, um, I actually, we can talk. Yeah, let's talk about that. But I do want to go back and I want you to say why rice fish are cool. So go tell me why. Talk about brine shrimp. Or actually, which one? Do oh, you want to rice fish are cool. Why? Yeah, why okay. are rice fish cool? Okay. No pun intended. I live in the Northwest. You live in the Northwest, right? From time to time. It gets cold outside in the winter, right? Not as cold as other places in the country, but it it's not it it's goes not into the It goes into the 20s and You're 30s not, You sometimes. know, it's not like when I lived in San Diego. We can, right. We can say that. Right. So uh, my rice fish will live outside in a pond all winter here. At one point this winter, um, there was... Uh, inch of ice on two of my smaller ponds. And I can attest to this as well. I have overwintered yeah. rice fish twice. Now, my larger pond um, has a, a nano air pump in it, so that one did not freeze. Um, so, But it, almost, it, it you basically just had that little blowhole yep. of air, right? But you had ice. No, not on that one. Oh, really? Nope. Oh, because of mine, um, did it two, just get the two years ago, two years ago, it was so cold that I got the giant layer of ice. Oh, wow. But yeah. you the, had the that air, one yeah, little blowhole. Yeah. The, the little blowhole, yeah. And that's enough, you know, but, but so they will tolerate just about any water condition, any temperature. Um, they're cool looking from the side. They're really cool looking from the top. Mm-hmm. So if you don't want a goldfish pond, um, you know, a rice fish pond makes mm-hmm. perfect sense. Uh, there are people, and, and I've thought about this a lot, that, you know, the reason that they don't put fish in their ponds is because it brings the raccoons and stuff. I don't think a raccoon's going to sit at the edge of a pond looking for rice fish. I have never seen, and I live out in the cuts, like I'm in the yep. forest. Uh, I have never had a raccoon, um, you know, I've never gone outside and right. seen something try to, whether it's a hawk or a, a, some type of a, a bird or a land-based critter, right. try to get into that pond. It's not a big enough meal for them. Mm-hmm. Where if they saw a six-inch goldfish in there, yep, that's a meal. Yep. Right? So uh, so that's the other reason. So And, you know, they're great community fish, too, besides all that. so I wonder, though, if you live close enough to where kingfishers naturally are. I, I, bet I bet you'd have a problem. Yeah, because that's a perfect snack yeah. size for a kingfisher. Yeah. Uh, I I mean, we get um, the stellar jays, uh-huh. but I think the cat constantly is going around the house, keeps them kind of away from where that. I get the stellar jays. I've never seen them around my ponds. They're always at the bird. And feeder. I don't know if they're they're not maybe a fish eating type bird. I yeah, don't know. you know they maybe they're scared of water. <laughs> Could be. Know. Who knows? Could so. be. They might not be built for it. So yeah, I think I think the other thing is rice fish are relatively new to America. Uh, I mean, not brand new. Um, I first had them about five or six years ago. I could not give the babies away. Mm. Um, what they look like? What what kind of variety? I had a lighter orange than what we have right okay. now. They call them gold, and I had the blue variety also. But I I would spawn them. And I could not give the I couldn't give the babies away the fry. Now it's like, do you have more? Do you have more? Yeah. What other variety do you have? For for yeah. me, it's it's the introduction via the co-op, right? Like before yeah. before I was an employee, this is one of the fish that you know Corey and Joel might have talked about on one of the real fish talks, or mm-hmm. you know him bringing up that oh I like rice fish, and then it's like oh what the heck is a rice fish? If Corey likes it, I better look it up. Right. And uh, you know you're like oh this is actually a pretty cool fish, and then yeah. you start going down the rabbit hole of the rooftop breeders in right. Japan. That's amazing. And how they selectively breed for the smaller patio kind of bowl pond setups. Right. Right? Like, you know, this is for, this is like the apartment koi. Right. right? You can't have True. a koi pond. True. Or you can't have a big goldfish pond, but you want something cool. And so here, enter the rice fish. Enter your one inch, right? Uh, you know, brightly colored and patterned. And patterned p- Potentially. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so, it, it, like, anybody should uh, look up 
you know, Google rice fish breeding in Japan. Oh, yeah, you'd be amazed. And yeah. it's just these yeah. rooftop setups of, you know, what are they, like 20-gallon totes? Right. They, like little tubs that yep. these Japanese breeders have. Um, and we, it's like, we don't even, we have like the tip of the iceberg of the varieties. Very like, tip. I've seen three. Yeah. Well, if you count the daisies rice fish, four. That's four. Right. I've seen four rice fish. Right. And these, each one of these breeders in Japan will have like a hundred different hundred varieties. hundred different types, and they will have their own... Mm-hmm. Their own strain that they've made themselves, and there's famous strains, and it's hardcore. It's koi and goldfish. It is, right? It is, and there, I mean, there's competitions for them too. Mm-hmm. And um, that would be one of the problems with taking me to China with you. <laughs> is come on, man, let's go. I want to bring back one of the big the uh, porcelain bowl things. Porcelain yeah, bowls. Yeah, those are so cool. And I know it would have to go on a pallet, and and it would be. It would probably cost more to ship it than I pay for it, but I don't care. I'm surprised you've never talked about this before because I, I have. Pro- I could probably just bring you one. Corey says no. It would. Uh, he said no. Yeah. It Corey did. said no. <laughs> I said Corey, but you can have one too. He said no. <laughs> when uh, when he's not controlling the forklift on on the unloading, there you go. And he doesn't see what's uh, what's being unloaded <laughs> and then all the shenanigans. So I. I so mean, here's the thing, though. If that thing causes us to get caught up at customs, I know that's and just delays it. our shipments. That's when the poop hits the fan because and we know, get in trouble. I was reading the other day that they they tend to, for for space wise, they pack the insides with with goods, and I'm like that could be a problem. No, because what we, we we would have the supplier like basically build the crate. Yep. And they would they would build an entire little wooden box around it. If not, ship it in like a double layered wooden box, right? And then we would just have to, yeah, we would just have to work with our logistics people to make sure that it wasn't, you know, put in a position where it's going to fall or anything like that. I mean, because I've seen, I've seen, you know, images and some videos of some really cool ones, you know, painted inside mm-hmm. and out, dragon pouring the water yeah. in, you know, up on a stand, you know, yeah. I mean, they are some really, and it would look really cool in my living room. Why don't you build like a Denny's Pet World style uh, pond little pond here? set up in here? That'd be awesome. Be- shout, out, shout out to Denny's be- Pet World. Be- be- because if it leaked... Okay. How's a bowl any different than the pond? It's not going to leak. It could crack. What's going to crack it if it's sitting Your on Your cat carpet? that knocked no, over my car the keys? Cat, <laughs> the cat would never be able to... The cat would drink out of it. I don't think... If you... One of those like real thick plastic ones... I mean, it's not exposed to the elements. It's not going to contract and, True. and do all yeah. that fun stuff. It's not the same. Not the. Not, I would trust. It's not the image I would that I want. The, I would trust the plastic more than the uh, than a glass aquarium. So yeah, I mean, I but, that actually, would, but yes, it would be amazing. Yes, it, I digress. Yeah. And and you know the thing is, if they had to pack the inside, pack a few of the smaller ones, because you've mm. seen you've seen the videos in Japan where they've gone down to little eight inch ones of these things with rice fish in them. Yeah, and plants. That's yeah. the other thing I like. I like the. Um, the plants that grow out mm-hmm. of them also. Um, so I've seen some cool paludarium style, like little five gallon, ten gallon aquariums on uh, on Instagram lately. Way cool with right? the, with the little betta. The betta's got maybe I don't know four gallons worth of water. And then but then you've got this awesome like paludarium style transition. Yep. Yep. Uh, it, those are those are pretty really cool. really yeah. awesome. I probably don't have the skill set to set one of those up, but I can appreciate it. And, and we can always try without the skill set. We right? could try. We <laughs> certainly could try. I did do a bioactive setup for my uh, gargoyle gecko. So awesome. I did, I did that. Good. Yeah, that Good. was actually not terrible. Good. It didn't turn out terrible. Cool. Um, so yeah, just kind of making a water space and transition is kind of like that next yeah. evolution, I guess. So well, kind of you know, there. And, and I've seen um, uh, Zenzo with the mud skippers mm-hmm. where it's kind of it's kind of a transition one and it's very cool. The Zenzo Street continues. Yeah. Shout out Zen- to uh, shout out to Zenzo. Yeah, to Zenzo to what? Well, what? what Tazawa. Is Tazawa, Tazawa tanks. tanks. Tazawa mm-hmm. tanks. Yeah. So, friend of the podcast. Exactly. Several times over. Yeah. <laughs> so rice fish. Uh, let's go back to why they're so cool. Temperature wise, um, easy. How warm do you think you could comfortably keep them? Uh, I've had them in the fish room into the. Mid eighties, mid and no signs of no signs of slowing nice. down. They even they even were throwing eggs in there. Oh wow, yeah, that is awesome. So a fish that is small, colorful, uh, prolific breeding, doesn't require a 
um, doesn't require a heater, right? And looks good. Like that checks and, and a, it eats pretty much anything. Eats pretty much anything. Like yeah. that checks a lot of boxes right. for an amazing right. uh, fish for somebody's home. You know your display tank setup. Yeah, and so like like you didn't. I, you might have seen it, but on top of my water filter down there, there's one of those critter cages. Okay. Yep. It's full of water. So last year, I went out to the outside pond, scooped it out, filled so. It, Got water mm-hmm. in it. And my goal was to photograph a rice fish egg. So I pulled out seven or eight eggs on the, and they were on some Java moss and put them in there. And turned out they ended up hatching before I got to the photographing <laughs> part. <laughs> That's so, hilarious. So you were such a, so, just a great breeder yeah. that the moment you touch the eggs, they hatch. <laughs> so, well, no. So I brought it into the fish room. I was going to wipe it down and everything and do a couple water changes to clear the water up. And, um, and then, you know, they go and hatch. So literally, and this is in some of the older aquarium co-op, they hatched and I just kept throwing baby brine shrimp in there. And pretty soon I had seven one-inch rice fish in maybe a gallon of water and I would do water changes. Uh-huh. It was really easy because I could just dump it in my drain bucket and fill it from any tank because. So they're fast growers too. Relatively fast. Yeah. I, I think the first few weeks it's relatively slow mm-hmm. and then it speeds up, but they're not like a rainbow fish slow. No, not yeah. that slow. No. I wonder why that is. Why are rainbow fish so slow to develop as fry? Oh, gee, we don't want into, to into, into grow in size. We don't really want to alienate anybody's, but I mean, down under, maybe because they're Australian. Maybe what? Because <laughs> their toilets flow in the opposite direction. Maybe, Is that why? But their whole water system flows opposite, doesn't it? I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't. I mean, there's that's, some, there's that's some Australians that listen to this podcast. Hopefully, they enjoy that bit yeah, of humor. And and we do want to come down there. Oh, most definitely, big time. That's that is like one of my dream list. Australia, Australia, yeah. New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. That would be pretty amazing. Uh, saltwater crocodiles, not a fan. Uh, a little scary. Uh, a lot of snakes. I wouldn't go in the water. Would, of, would I have to go in the water? <laughs> we're, we're two aquarists that okay. go collecting fish. We would have to go in the water. <laughs> <laughs> we would have to go in the water, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I often wonder about that, about, about you know, when you see TV shows. and, and Crocodile they're, hunter And in they're particular. going in the water. And I'm like... Okay, is there a whole team of people that have swept that water clean of crocodiles before they get in so that the star of the TV show can jump in the water? And Maybe. I often wonder about Maybe. that. Maybe. Well, that's why I liked, I felt so comfortable in the, in the Amazon is that you got Cayman, right? You, but you Cayman, Cayman don't mess with people. Not really. But you got anacondas. Yeah. They don't really mess with people. You got big arapaima, but unless you're like bothering them, it's going the other way. They're not gonna sm- they're not gonna take their big bony head and smash no, it into you. They're, so they're you're going the other way. You know, leopards, yeah. No, jaguars. I'm jaguars. Sorry. Jaguars, you never see those guys. Like you're yeah. pretty you're pretty okay from an animal perspective. I think so. Yeah. yeah but, but ton of bugs. Ton but, of bugs and and water bugs, but yeah. but also but like the, you're also in a group. Mm-hmm. So that group can be kind of threatening. Well, to so hear me out on this one. We go and do collecting in Africa in one of the Rift Lakes or anywhere in Africa. Hippos. Yep. Lions. Yep. Crocodiles. <laughs> like Pam Chin talking yeah. about her Tanganyika fish collecting. <laughs> and she's like, oh, yeah, the guides say this spot is good. The crocodiles don't come out until afternoon. Right. I until remember like that. After, are you, and, you're, and these guys are going in yeah. the water that, are, that is known crocodile water right, exactly and and this isn't like randy's like alligator phobia in 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 florida like those crocodile eat people they like, do eat people straight up and they're not scared of us no they're not scared. no they're not i mean even i mean now what about the time in the amazon people that listen to this probably just think i'm the biggest baby which there is was not someone untrue. that dropped something Oh, me and, dropping my GoPro? And literally dove down to I get it. Down, and I got it. And was fishing from the boat that same day for piranhas. Yeah, I, I wasn't. So I'm the piranhas a, aren't bugging you? No. The dolphin, though. What is that blue dolphin fish, though? 
that could that could be scary. That yeah. so it's what is it like a, a nine inch long fish or something yeah. that apparently just can bore through your body. Right, that could be. scary. It could just take a massive chunk out of you. It would just so, start eating. Yeah, yeah, so like that's like the one legitimate thing, and that actually did happen to somebody on one of their trips where yeah. it attached to their calf. Right. In just like knee deep started water, eating, yep. and just started going to town. Yeah. So good times for the uh, the dolphin. Yeah. The dolphin but, fish. You know, I mean, I think. Relatively safer. Yes. Relatively speaking, safer. Yes. Um, what were we talking about? Caimans and crocodiles. Allig- and no, uh, Australia. We're talking about Australia. Australia. Yeah, we're talking about we're dealing with yeah, so, so Australia, you still are on my list. Yes. One day. All the places. Yeah. All the places are on the list. Yeah. I think we're definitely doing China in November. I think cool. that's a thing. I'm um, probably I'm probably going to Florida next month. Maybe that's when I'll get the big Do you want to come to Florida with me? Florida. What, Do you want to go are you canal? collecting fishing? Ah, uh, no, vendors. Uh, Do you want to go canal hopping? And then I might meet up with. Uh, I need to reach out to Zane. So the that would be fun. The guy that I yeah. that I uh, interviewed last episode, I think. Uh, but he goes out and just microfishes. So he, this guy is microfishing for like pygmy sunfish. Nice for minnows nice. for like top minnows. Yeah, it is awesome. So he's looking for the small fish, the smallest of the small yeah. with the smallest of the small tackle. That's very cool. It is yeah. awesome. But then he does also go out and he'll get bass and all sorts of other stuff. Right. Um, I think I saw this once before in a video where guys were doing bass fishing in the uh, Miami canals mm-hmm. and they were getting snakeheads. That sounds awesome. Mm. Cause that, that's almost like you just put any lure in the water and a snakehead's going to try to crush it. I would say so. Like the snake is just going to go it's for gonna, it. It's going to, because it's a predator. Mm-hmm. It's going to, if it's in my territory, I'm eating. And word on the street, they are tasty. They are tasty. I fish. believe it. I believe it. I don't know. I, if I, I mean, I mean, think about uh, when we're in Peru. I mean, I mean, I was thinking the other day about all the different types of fish that I tried. <laughs> we tried, what, maybe 20, 30? And discus was probably the least tasty of them. I, and, but I the, thought it was good. It was no. Don't get me wrong. It was good, but it wasn't. It wasn't yeah. uh, tiger shovel nose. Tiger shovel nose was probably the best we tried, yeah. and we had that two di- two or three different ways. I think we had. Did we get the dorado we, as well? The ceviche? gold version of it. Oh god, the ceviche was so good. The, oh, we we had it ceviche man. style, which ceviche actually originated in Peru. Really? Yeah, mostly on the coast hmm. for um, saltwater fish, but they've taken it inland for the freshwater fish. I make a pretty mean ceviche. Yeah, it was. Um, it's delicious. But that tiger shovel nose was. That really thing was really amazing. Yeah. And, well, the irony of like pound for pound uh, that the most expensive ornamental fish was the least tasty of yes. the fish that we ate. Right. And like, because I would say that the pleco was probably tastier. I really like. I really like the broth of the pleco. It was delicious. I, I could have. Bottled that. We, we need to start the campaign of, you know, eating the invasive plecos in Florida in those bodies of water. Yeah, I'm surprised water. they have not done that. Uh, well, I'm actually surprised. The There's chefs, billions of them. The chefs are starting to um, try to work with, like, invasive carp. So all, like, the invasive species we have, usually you get a solution of an adventurous chef is going to come along and say, no, like, you can actually prepare it this way, and it's actually not that bad. Um, I think a lot of the carp, when they catch it, it ends up going to, like, dog food or something. I've, I've had carp before. I think it tastes, like, mush. Not so good. It's like it's like eating fish oatmeal. Yeah, but with fish though, it's always it's always fifty fifty depending on who you're talking to yeah. and how you prepare it. Right. True. You talk to people that that catch barracuda. Fifty percent of the people will say, of sport fishermen will say, barracuda is an absolute trash fish, right. and the other half will say, it is amazing. You just have to soak it in milk, or you have to properly handle it once you catch yeah, it, put it on ice. Something. Like there's always it's always like this polarizing like right. you know short of like bluefin tuna, which who doesn't like bluefin tuna. Uh, but I was just going to say, there are people that just absolutely hate tuna, no matter how it's prepared. I can see like tuna in a can if that's your only exposure. Yeah. Well, and, and a lot of people, I mean, I'll give you a good example. Brussels sprouts. I like me some Brussels sprouts. Fresh. Cut in half. Oven roasted. roasted. Oh. Yeah. Olive oil, sprinkle Olive salt oil, on some there. Olive oil, salt, some pepper. Yeah. <laughs> Cooking with so Dean. So I never had Brussels sprouts cooked properly and they're adorable until i was an adult working in a restaurant all the brussels sprouts i'd had previously to that were out of a can do they even still make canned no, brussels they, sprouts they they're frozen, frozen. They're yeah frozen they're flash now. frozen yeah. they were horrible that sounds terrible and and you know and not that they weren't quote good for you but mm-hmm. i think in the state in the can 
No. Well, you grew up to in the time of trading quality for convenience. Yes. Like that part of Western yes. society where we said, hey, cooking this dinner in the microwave is so much better. Right. Let's do that. Right. Because look at all this time we have now. And we've realized over like the past 20 years, like maybe even 10. 10 like, years probably, I'd say. Oh, it actually like farmed it in the farm to table is a trendy term, but like it is, but you it's know, farm, true. like a like a more farm to table, more natural, holistic food, like right. the, a slower, more traditional preparation, yep. is actually just better for you, just better, and it tastes better. <laughs> tastes, I mean, and for me, a lot of it was I would eat those mushy Brussels sprouts. I'm like, the texture would just make me want to gag. That, that is the equivalent of us not seeing the stars. Exactly. Like, all we've ever done, like if, if all you've True. ever eaten is TV dinners, like right. if that's what you grew up on right. and you t- actually taste something that's, you know, somewhat traditionally prepared, yeah. you're like, oh my God, this is, this is infinitely better. Right. A whole, whole lot better. Yeah. So yeah. Um, what were we talking about fish wise? Uh, is this a fish podcast? Is this oh, a this tropical is a fish, fish podcast. Or is it a, is it a, just two dudes talk about random stuff? Um, so, I, I will say Dean that coming here and doing this visit, walking your fish room, uh, you know, holding the flashlight while you pick out those beautiful <laughs> platinum uh, rice fish eggs has given me a kind of a shot in the arm for my own fish room because I'm kind of hitting this point where uh, I was in a little bit of a lull and I think I'm still kind of in it. Um, you know, there's been some changes at work, so now I can actually spend some more time at home, working from home, put more time into my fish room. Um, but I think this has a, been a great visit for me to just get excited about what another aquarist is doing. Right. Um, and of course, like uh, b- another aquarist, I mean, it's, it's you, Dean, like you are, you know, you are a legend in, unto yourself in this hobby. And so that's a very privileged standpoint that I get to come and, and see your fish room in this kind of interaction. Uh, but it's definitely excited me to, to just go into my fish room and, you know, maybe scrub a couple of tanks down and, you know, do a little bit more gravel vacuum, which I did. I, I, I have been keeping up on my vacuum though. I have been keeping up on keeping the mulm out of the tanks. Um, but you know, as far as like wiping down sides and just doing all the little, little maintenance things and organizing that I've kind of been slacking on. Um, yeah. And then just focus on like, what's the next kind of breeding project that I want to work yeah, on what, and, and be excited about what's it. What's the fish. I mean, I mean, actually, you know, you might not have seen the video yet, but you've been, you have been to the shop lately. Yes. Um, kudos to Robert. He's bringing in some really cool fish. Mm hmm. I mean, he had pipe fish in there a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the the um, was it called the mud fish? Which one was the mud fish? The I'm one that, that one. hit would kind of trap his food with his mouth. It's an eel like fish. Oh yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah. sure if that's what it was actually called, but I think that's what it was called. I think Robert was meshing me. He was very excited about that he, one. They yeah. were pretty cool. I mean, uh, so despite you know COVID kind of shutting things down. Robert has still been able to get hold of some really mm-hmm. cool, really neat fish, uh, some one-off fish. Um, well, and that's a testament to him having a passion for the hobby. Yeah, that he's you know he is going he's going to order the bread and butter stuff that we need to have. Got to have that. But he's going to experiment. And he's going to bring in a few oddballs to spice and things up. Right. You know, because there are customers that want those oddballs. Oh, there, yeah. There's some cool stuff. And I mean, if you see, if I would have had tank space, I would have tried a lot of it. <laughs> you know, so. And that that's actually, you know, one of the things that I miss is having tank space. Uh, because it's like if I see something or if someone offers me something, I can't do it mm-hmm. because I don't have tank space. Do you do you try to shoot for a certain number of like do you always want to have one or two open tanks at any given time? I like to. Okay. Or three or four. <laughs> I mean, and they don't have to be big or small tanks. Right, right. Just, you know, like like for example, if I if I stop in at the well, I've been delivering fish to the co-op once or twice every month. So if I'm taking fish there and I, and Robert says, "Oh, look at these pipe fish," I go, "Okay, I'll take a half a dozen of those." <laughs> it's because I never buy one fish of anything. Mm-hmm. And I was talking with a guy the other day about this. It's like one of my problems is if I get fish a new fish i have to get enough where i can attempt to breed sure and that's not necessarily a good quality because it takes tank space a lot of people will say okay i'll just take one of the pipe fish and i'm saying okay i'll take a dozen of them well like a normal aquarium right consumer right right you've got your one or two display tanks in your house right right yeah right so 
So you we're know, on the deep end. Or yeah, we're, we're, when you're a fish breeder with a fish room, you are in a different. Yeah, class. You, you're, you are. You you can't just buy one. Yeah. Uh, you know, like like uh, someone was offering me some um, plecos a while back. I said, okay, I need a dozen. He's a dozen. <laughs> I said, yeah. I mean, because you know, I mean, in theory, I want to say. I keep all of those dozen alive to adulthood, but there there's always the chance of losing some along the mm-hmm. way. I mean, there's, there's a chance of that with any fish that you buy. Um, even though, you know, we, we do our best to keep them alive. You never know. It's hedging your bets yeah. with a time investment. Right. Right. And then right. it's also, even if you don't lose any, that male to female ratio. That's what was that? Right. The second part of the yeah. bet. That's like, is that what you call the river card? Oh, we're talking uh, about Texas Hold'em? I don't play poker, so I don't... But I think the last card is the river, is right? Is the river, yeah. So if you if you have that river card, you know, then you've hedged your bet. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, so, yeah, that's one of my... That's the downside of being Dean, <laughs> is one fish won't, won't make you happy. <laughs> An insatiable appetite yeah. for fish breeding. I'm saying for that with fish tears in my eyes. So then, so then your longevity in the hobby, has it been more just your obsessive drive? Like, yeah. ha, has your obsessive drive potentially pushed you through moments of like, why am I in this hobby? You're getting potentially bored. Well, my wife called me a hoarder the other day. Nice. <laughs> we can walk around your house without tripping on stuff. You're not a hoarder. Yeah, most of the place. Um, but um, we have the benefit that our animals are in water. That's true. And That's they're true. not like in cages, so their poo doesn't we, just and we're, fill up. We're lucky about that. Yeah. Uh, although I do spray the house down with uh, air freshener before anybody comes over because I want to make sure that they can't is smell. That, is, it, is that what that crisp linen scent is yes. in the air, Dean? I, th- yeah. I thought so. Yeah. I thought I smelled some Febreze air. So, um, yeah. So, you know, it's it's always, okay, if I get that, can I breed it? If we collect that, do I have enough specimens that are going to make it home um, to be able to try to breed it? You know what bummed me out? I got very excited about a red leopard swordtail. Yep. Okay. And I was looking around on various websites, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to pull the trigger on a group. And then I found out that uh, one of our distributors actually had them, or our wholesalers. I said, okay. sweet. I said, Robert, bring me in a dozen. Order them. Right? And you got all males. So here's our dozen thing, right? And the kicker, their order sheet says that they sell them in pairs. Oh, I'm going to get wow. six males, six females. Yeah. They come in, two females. Wow. Ten males. Any babies yet? No babies yet. So mm-hmm. I've, uh, oh yeah, I, I, I shared that with you guys in the group yeah. chat. Um, no babies yet. They are in a 40 breeder, heavily planted 40 breeder on their own. Um, you know, they're getting baby brine shrimp uh, basically every day for quite some, I haven't hatched brine shrimp in a couple weeks. I've kind of taken a little bit of a break from that, but I was, I was hatching every single day. Um, a lot of it. So like everything yep. was getting the brine shrimp, even, even like my son's 10 gallon up in his right. room. Like I'd sneak up there with a little pipette and squirt that in there. Give him some baby brine. Uh, right. yeah. And so, yeah, definitely bummed about that. But again, ordering 12, right. That you, dozen, you, right. I at least got two females and then I picked the best male. And then my neighbor who I set up his 40 breeder, which planted wise is doing amazing. Um, he's got one of like my, my gen one, um, or my F one, I guess I should say, uh, angel fish. That's just like this massive, beautiful black fish in there. And I gave him like four of the males. Okay. And so he's at least able to enjoy them. And the weird thing is on that 40 breeder, he had one 3.0 and I went and I got him a second 3.0, a 36 incher. Okay. And the, it didn't notice it at the time, but the, the, the males, the fish would only stay. It seemed like they were scared of the angel fish. And so they are always what seemed like hiding. The moment we put that second 3.0 on there, they came out like it was nobody's business. They just wanted to be where the light was. Where the light is. And he happened to have the light in the back of the 40 breeder. So that back nine inches, as opposed to the front. Got it. For for act for easy lit access. But once I gave him that second light, because his plants in the front weren't doing as well as sure. the ones in the back, sure. they just started using the whole aquarium. Nice. I had never seen that before. Well, and and that's why on the 75 down there that Aquarium Co-ops, Lizzie <laughs> planted for me. And it looks amazing. Well done, Lizzie Block. I um I have a 3.0 on that. Uh-huh. And I raised the light up. Yeah. Because it lights the whole thing. And I'm still not running the light at full intensity because mm-hmm. um, I want to keep the algae down. But, yeah. But the plants are growing, so that's all that matters. I had never experienced that, though. Yeah. A fish 
being attracted to the light and only wanting to stand with the light. And it wasn't so much the angelfish, which, you know, if they go around the angelfish, it will scare them off. But the angelfish isn't persistently chasing them. It was just they wanted to be where the light was. So let, so going back to the ones you have left, you've got, what, two pairs? Or one, a couple oh, one trio. One, one trio. trio. Okay. So you got one trio. Are the females pregnant yet? I don't think so. Why not? Uh, they're live bears. Randy's they, uh, bad at his job. I don't. Live bears well, don't need you. And that was well, <laughs> right. And that was so. That was a part of this conversation, or uh, the original thought of this interview would be, um, you know, just from my own personal, not so much failures, but just lack of success, which is another way to say failure. What Dean would do in certain situations. So, like with these sword tails, which are clearly, you know, male two females. What should I try? Rare fish that you want. Yeah, and you want to propagate them. Mm-hmm. So I would have maybe kept a couple other males just in case. I did. Oh, so you'd have other males. I still have a couple of them. Okay, so so what I want to see is I want to see those females get pregnant, and then as soon as they're pregnant, they're out of a community tank, at least for the first batch of fry. So now you have fry to work with that you've raised in your own water. That's mm-hmm. always one of my goals is like, and, and clubs, here you go for my breeders award <laughs> rant, you know, just warning you in advance. Uh, no one should get breeder points until they've bred fish that they've raised to adults from babies. And this is where, uh, what, Oh, so this isn't your thing where you don't submit until you breed your, 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 F1s, right? Right. Okay. So so a lot of times F1 is used from F1 from the wild, Mm -hmm. but F1 can also be used like... From when you take possession. From when you take possession of the fish. Uh, I mean, it used to be, uh, you know, okay, there's... I breed a pair of cribs and I turn in the BAP points and then I sell those cribs and then now you breed that same pair of cribs and and sell them to another member or trade them to another member. And pretty soon... Five members in the club have all bred the same pair of cribs. And they get BAP. All of them got BAP points for the same pair of cribs. Mm -hmm. You know, so in my opinion, I breed that pair of cribs. I raise those babies to adults. I get them to pair off. And then I breed them. Then I get BAP points. Mm. So clubs, sorry. Yeah. End of rant. Yeah. So the devil's (laughs) devil's advocate advocate for that would be... Um, making it more accessible and exciting and easier yes. to get the points. Yeah. yeah. Where you're almost in like, you're in the secret hardcore bat right. program where it's like, you know, you don't talk about this program and it's right. ultra hardcore. Yeah. I definitely, I could definitely see that. Um, Cause I think with ours, it, they really only have to be, I think it's 30 days. Right. Um, right. Which I need to, uh, I need to snap a picture and get my uh, Geophagus Pellegrini. You do. Yeah. Yeah. Are those going to go to the shop too? Yeah, they, they got yeah, to right. Yeah, yeah. I think Robert he should be able to move. He'll them. be able to move. Them. They're pretty right. fish. As soon as as soon as the word's out that they're there, they would move. The Pellegrini. Yeah. Check forum that's a, that's a aquarium, pretty aquarium fish. Forum for the local shop updates. On Maybe what Robert has. Yeah, I think he still does that I weekly think he updates. Does. And and so so going back to the uh, the sword tails right. Mm-hmm. So I would, I would, as soon as I know that the females are pregnant, I'm going to separate them out. I'm going to get that first batch. I've never seen a female get pregnant. I've never seen that fat body on one of these yet. females yet. 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 Yeah, I mean, you, you probably will eventually, but, um, or, or you might have to switch males up. Uh, okay. So then at what point? Or put, or put another male in there for competition. Okay. So we're about, I think, was this, I've had them for maybe two months now. And they're full grown? Full grown. Yeah, it's time. Okay. So at, what, what would you do? Add a male or switch a male? If you had two more males, I'd add two more males. Oh, so two females and three males? Yeah. I mean, think think about... I guess... I guess Think I get, about guppies. Guppy males are always chasing the females, and it's never just one. I get concerned about the harassment on the females and exhausting them. So that's where I'm like, eh, I'd rather... So Because if I was the female, I wouldn't <laughs> want to be chased around all day by like three... If they have enough cover, they can get away from it. Yeah, which there's there is plenty yeah. of cover in this tank. Um, I had to I had to take out guppy grass like yeah yeah a, a beach ball of guppy grass and, out of this tank. And I still can't keep guppy grass alive. Just by the way, <laughs> I've taken some from Corey's. I think I've taken some from. Well, you. yeah, I think so. My guppy grass I gave to you, and then I eventually gave it to Corey. So that should be that same guppy same grass. stuff. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I'll, I'll keep it alive for like two weeks, and it slowly just melts away. Hmm. 
And it doesn't matter whether I fertilize it, whether I water change, whether I put guppies in with it. You know what? It doesn't matter because your pink flamingo, your crypt pink flamingo know. looks amazing it and is spreading runners. So is. I yeah. would take that over being able to have successful guppy grass. I, I would love. rather have the guppy grass. <laughs> I'd yeah, I, you want, I want both. Yeah. You know, that's the truth. So, um, yeah, that one, that plant did come along really good. Yeah. I was surprised. So switch the mail or add the males? I would, what would Dean I would add the males. Okay. Because then you've got competition for the female. If there's enough cover, the female's going to get away. Feed them heavier than what you think, as long as it's not going to pollute the tank. I feed heavy. Yeah. I'm sloppy. And, and especially uh, when know. my sons are helping. And then um, those might need some coral in the water, especially around here. Crushed coral. There is yeah. crushed coral in that oh, tank. Good. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. And then I would just, you know, I would keep them alive and make sure those females get pregnant. If they don't, chances are they never will. Mm. Um, you know, maybe they've been treated so that they're not going to ever get pregnant. You know, you never know. Is there a perp? Do they do, do breeders do that purposely sometimes like these larger operations? <sighs> I wouldn't put it past. You're never going to actually hear it done, but I would say yes. Wow. And it's it's mostly done overseas. Mm -hmm. um, that was very common years ago in the discus world. They would um, color treat them so all of them looked the same, males and females, and um, and then they would basically be infertile when they got old, older. What were the what's the color treating? They would use um, I can't think of the name of it. It was. Uh, Started with methyl testosterone. Methyl testosterone. Yeah. So basically, it's testosterone. Okay. They add that to the food or the water, and it makes all of the fish color up. This was all of the inbred fish, not mm -hmm. wild ones. So that, you know, you would end up with a solid turquoise discus at a nickel or quarter size. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, those would never be breeders in the future. Hmm. They would still grow. Mm hmm. But they would never be breeders. Interesting. And were they doing it to have a more attractive fish at that smaller size, or were they doing yes. it also to keep people from being able to then breed them? I think most of it at first was for selling. Uh huh. You know, you could sell because typically discus don't color up until they're about two or three inches. Mm -hmm. And if you could sell it at a nickel size, solid turquoise. Right. Like, wow. Yeah. You know. So, so. It, it's almost like an unintended benefit mm -hmm. to them. It's like, oh, great, we get a better-looking fish, sell it sooner, and nobody else can breed it. Right. Nice. But but then again, you know, you look a lot at, at a lot of the um, rams that are shipped in, almost all males. You know, where are all the females? Yeah. You know, um, they're probably not shipped because everybody knows that the males sell better, mm -hmm. and more colorful. And, and actually... That's an opinion on the rams. I actually think the female rams are gorgeous with the pink belly. It adds a whole nother color to the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, but it, I think it happens in quite a few fish. Um, whether intentionally or not, that's up for debate. Hmm. So at what point when I add in these next... So I'm going to add in the two males. So I'll have three males, these two females. Yep. How long after that, assuming I'm feeding... Heavy baby really brine good. shrimp feeding really well, and I'm still not seeing pregnant fish. I mean, this is a tank with cover. It's a 40 breeder, crushed coral, regular water changes, the whole shebang. Temp's about 75, 76. So isn't the gestation period about 35 days or so? I'm shrugging my shoulders right now. And I haven't st studied them in a, quite a while, so I can't remember. It's either 35 or 45 days. Guppies, it's usually about a month. Mm. Sword tails, I think it's a little bit longer. So for me, they're doing all of that. If everything's right, they should be pregnant in a week. Mm -hmm. And so what, two months? Mm -hmm. Two months go by and you have no fry? Yeah. Cause, I mean, now to show that Randy actually can breed live bears up above them in a 30 breeder, I started with uh, the... Uh, they are... Leertail, mm -hmm. Leertail mollies, mm -hmm. prolific. 
I mean, that tank I've got, I've spread the fry around with like three or four different tanks, nice. and I need to start taking those into the shop. Yeah. But they are those are cool producing fish too. like crazy. Are they the black ones or? It's uh, Robert gave me a, a mix. It's uh, okay. black, oranges, some gold, nice. uh, calico. So perfect it's a, it's for a, it's selling. A whole, a whole mix in there. Yeah, yeah that's perfect. why I told him. I'm like, dude. Just give me yeah. fish I've never worked with before, but you're gonna have a super easy time selling. And yep. he was like, uh, "Take these, take these leer tail ones. Yep. Cool, let's do it." And you know, there's, I mean, there's other people like like me. I'm doing the super red koi angels, and I'm not crossing those, so to speak, with other angels. There are angel breeders out there that will take one and one, and you end up producing five or six different varieties of angels, and so. Um, and they're very successful doing that. Um, I just don't, angels, I just don't do it that way. But I can easily see what you're doing with the sword deal that works great. Because mm-hmm. they have everything, every color gamut to sell mm-hmm. in the store. So basically, you know, dad and his daughter come into the store and she says, well, I like the orange one and dad likes the black one or whatever, you know. Then they sell two. Yeah. You know, or get the calico. It's or both. get the calico. It's both <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, because I mean, uh, little kids love to name the fish, you know, and so that gives them the, such an opportunity that mm-hmm. they all look different. So yeah, yeah. Well, Dean, we are closing in on that nine-hour mark. Are we? We're actually about to hit an hour and a half, my man. Oh, not bad. Yeah, yeah. Re- really good. So episode one hundred, Dean Tweedale. Episode one hundred, three time, trice over. Quad? No, you're a quad now at this point, I think. Am I? I don't even know. I think we've done it in, in at this table three times, and then once in Peru with oh, Corey. We did do it in Peru. That was almost a lost episode? That yeah. was on the bed. Oh, didn't tell people that. <laughs> you're a goof. <laughs> it, true, true statement, though. It was. You and Corey. Okay, you, you and but, Corey were on the bed. I was in the chair. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that hotel was luxurious after that boat ride. And, and that's the hotel I'm going to ever stay at. In the future. Definitely. It was awesome. It was yeah. a great hotel. Yeah. yeah. Great hotel. Yeah. Dean Tweedell, thank you very All much, right. sir. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. You bet.